Hey everybody, it's Miss Martinez again. Uh, for today's lesson, I'm actually going to do a read aloud. So as promised, I'm going to do the second book to um, A Tale in Dark and Grim. This one's called In a Glass Grimly, and of course it's by our favorite author, Adam Gidwitz. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this story for you today. Once upon a time, fairy tales were horrible. Not boring horrible, not so cute you want to jump out the window horrible. Horrible like they define it in the dictionary. Horrible, adjective, causing feelings of horror, dread, unbearable sadness, and nausea. Also tending to produce nightmares, whimpering for one's parents, and bedwetting. I know, I know, you're thinking, fairy tales? Horrible? Please. I get that. If you've been raised on the drivel that passes for fairy tales these days, you're not going to believe a word that I'm saying. First of all, you're probably used to hearing the same boring fairy tales over and over and over again. Today, children, we're going to read a Cinderella story from China. Today, children, we're going to read a Cinderella story from Madagascar. Today, children, we're going to read a Cinderella story from the moon. Today, children, second of all, those fairy tales that you hear over and over and over again aren't even the real fairy tales. Has your teacher ever said to you, today, children, we're going to read a Cinderella story where the set stepsisters cut off their toes and their heels with a butcher's knife, and then they get their eyes pecked out by birds. Ready? Is everyone sitting crisscross applesauce? No? She's never said that? I didn't think so. But that's what the real fairy tales are like. Strange bloody, and horrible. 200 years ago in Germany, the Brothers Grimm first wrote down that version of Cinderella in which the stepsisters slice off pieces of their feet and get their eyes picked out. In England, a man named Joseph Jacobs collected tales like Jack the Giant Killer, which is about a boy named Jack who goes around murdering giants in the most gruesome and grotesque ways imaginable. And there was this guy called Hans Christian Andersen who lived in Denmark and wrote fairy tales filled with sadness and humiliation and loneliness. Even Mother Goose's rhymes could get pretty dark. After all, Jack and Jill go up a hill and then Jack falls down and breaks his head open. Yes, Fairy tales were horrible, in the original sense of the word. But even these horrible fairy tales and nursery rhymes aren't true. They're just stories, right? Not exactly. You see, buried in these rhymes and tales are true stories of true children who fought through the darkest times and came out the other end stronger, braver, and usually completely covered in blood. This book is the tale of two such children, a boy named Jack and a girl named Jill. Yes, they do fall down a hill at one point, and yes, Jack does break his head wide open. But there is more than that. There is a beanstalk, there are giants, there might even be a mermaid or two. Their story is terrifying. It is revolting. It is horrible. It is the most horrible fairy tale I have ever heard. Also, it is beautiful. Not sweet, not cute, beautiful. Like the gray and golden ashes in a fireplace or like the deep russet of a drying stain of blood. And best of all, it's true. Now, let me just say that if you happen to be the kind of person who actually likes cute and sweet fairy tales, 
or the kind of person who thinks children should not read about decapitation and dismemberment. Or finally, if you're the kind of person who, upon hearing about two children wading through a pool of blood and vomit, runs out of the room screaming, you don't need to worry. This book is for you. There is no decapitation, dismemberment, people without clothing, or pools of blood and vomit anywhere in this book. At least, not anywhere in the first few pages. Wait, you're probably asking. What was that about people without clothing? Nothing. Moving right along. This chapter is called The Wishing Well. Once upon a time, there was a kingdom called Martian, which sat just next to the modern countries of England, Denmark, and Germany. I need to interrupt already. I apologize. No one in the history of the world has ever pronounced the word Martian correctly. Some people say Martian, like what the ants go doing if you're from Texas, and that's not right. Some people say Martian, that's closer, but still wrong. Others say Martian, that's about as close as I've ever gotten to pronouncing it right. So it's probably good enough for you too. But if you really want to say the name of the kingdom that this story takes place correctly, and I don't know why you would, I'm just offering because I'm nice like that, you've got to say mare. Then you've got to make a sound in your throat like you're hawking a loogie. And then you have to say shen like this. Mare shen. You know what? You might just want to say marching. At the center of the kingdom, Marchen was a castle. Behind this castle was a hidden grove. In the grove was a well. And at the bottom of the well, there lived a frog. He was a sad frog. He did not like his well. It was wet and mossy and dirty and very, 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 very smelly. All day long, the frog sat at the bottom of his well as salamanders splashed around him. Now, maybe you know it and maybe you don't, but salamanders are not the most popular creatures in the animal kingdom. But why? Salamanders seem all right to you. There are lots of pretty colors like shimmery purple and glowy red. They have tiny black eyes that stare at you oh so very cutely. And they have these little mouths that are permanently curled into tiny, maybe smiles. All of this is true. But in addition to the pretty colors and the tiny eyes and the maybe smiles, they have these shrill little voices, which they use to ask the most idiotic, mind-numbing questions that you have ever heard. For example, why is blue? Or who is a stone? Or what tastes better, a fly or a fly? Or who is uglier, me or Fred? Is it me? It's me, right? Me? Is it me? The sad frog's only solace <clears throat> amid the damp and the filth and the smell and the salamanders was the sky. All day and all night, the frog stared up at a little patch of sky that peered down into his clearing. Sometimes it was gray like slate. Other times it was inky black. Other times it was washed with a burning red. But most of the time, the sky above his well was a clear, deep blue with white shapes like fluffy rocks that floated across its face. All day and all night, he stared up, unblinking at that sky. And then, one day, while the frog was staring up at his sky, he heard a peculiar stomp, stomp, stomping on the forest floor. It was followed by a sudden woof and then a cry. Curious, he climbed the slippery stone wall to the top of his well and peered out. Sitting on the forest floor with matted hair and muddied clothes was a little girl. Her face was red with anger and exertion. 
Her lips were all scrunched up and furious, but her eyes, the frog studied them. Her eyes, well, her eyes looked just like the patch of sky above his well when it was its clearest, deepest blue. They can't play ball with my ball, the little girl bellowed at no one in particular. They can't, it's mine. She began to throw the ball up and down, glancing over her shoulder from time to time to see if she had been followed into the wood and returning disappointed to her ball each time she discovered she had not been. The frog watched, mesmerized. And where you or I might have begun to suspect this little girl of being a selfish brat, the frog, not knowing many, any humans, saw only a maiden who had somehow captured the sky and kept it jailed behind her eyelids. And he suddenly felt that if only he could spend the rest of his days in the presence of this beautiful creature, he would be perfectly and totally happy. So the frog began to croak at the top of his lungs. Maybe she'll notice me, he thought. And then he thought, maybe she'll take me home with her. And then he thought, wait, she doesn't live with salamanders. And so he put every ounce of hope that flowed through his froggy little veins into each expert amphibian warble. But, of course, the girl did not notice him. She only threw her ball up and down, up and down. The frog sat there croaking for a full hour, but never once did she look at him. Finally, she stood up and took her ball out of the wood. The frog, in despair, threw himself from the edge of his well down to the depths, hoping that the long fall would kill him. It didn't. Instead, the salamanders began to nudge him with their blunt noses. Hey, hey, hey! Are you dead? Are you, frog? Frog? What is it like to be dead? Am I dead? Am I smelly? Who's smellier, me or Fred? Me? It's me, right? The frog shoved moss into his ear holes. But to the frog's great joy, the girl returned to the wood to play with her ball the next day, and the day after, and the day after that. And every day the frog wooed her with the most magnificent croaks he could muster. But she never noticed him. Still, he took pleasure in watching her, examining her utterly perfect beauty, and imagining all the happy times they might one day spend together. Alas, dear reader, you know as well as I do the mistake that our poor friend the frog is making. We all know that beauty is well and fine, but that it is unimportant when compared to questions of goodness, kindness, intelligence, and honesty. And watching the girl throwing her ball in the air, the frog could determine nothing of these things. In fact, he knew next to nothing about her. He did know that this isn't, <clears throat> excuse me, that this wasn't just any little girl he had fallen in love with. She was the princess, the king's only daughter. He also did not know that as pretty as she was, she was a horror sweet and pretty on the outside, cruel and selfish on the inside. If you know anything about children, dear reader, perhaps this will not surprise you. Perhaps you know that one of the greatest dangers in life is growing up very pretty. You see, when you are very pretty, people tend to remark on your looks. They smile at you more easily. They are more permissive of your faults. Soon, you will come to believe that your prettiness matters and that you are better because you are pretty and that all it takes to get through life is a batting of your eyelashes and a twisting of your hair around your little finger and that you can scream and pout and shout and tease because everyone will still like you anyway because you are unbelievably pretty. This is what many very pretty people think. Beware then, for this is how monsters are made. And I fear that our poor frog 
has fallen in love with a pretty little monster. One day, the girl came to the well rather later than usual. <clears throat> Excuse me. As she played with her ball in the small clearing, the sun began to set and the edges of twilight rose like a black mist in the east. The darkness made it harder to see the ball and so on. On one particular toss, the princess missed it and it bounced directly into the well. The girl yelped and ran to the well's edge. She peered down into the dark. The frog, who had never been so close to the girl, stared at her and tried not to hyperventilate. Suddenly, the girl began to wail like a foghorn. She wailed and wailed and wept and wailed some more. Well, it pained the frog to see her like that. He croaked at her, trying to comfort her, but she paid no attention to him. Oh, if only she could hear me, he thought. If only she knew I was trying to help her. As the girl wept into the darkness of the well, tears ran down her face, dropped from her dimpled chin, and splashed into the black water below. Far up above, the first few stars had just begun to appear in the sky. The tears that fell into the well shook the surface of the water and with it, the stars' reflection. Now maybe you know it, and maybe you don't, but this is the only way to wake the stars, and awake they did. Meanwhile, the frog was trying with all his might to croak something that the girl might understand. I can get your ball, he tried to tell her. I can help you, beautiful, radiant, perfectly non-amphibious creature. And as he stared into her cerulean eyes, now fading to gray in the dying light, he went beyond wanting to help her and even beyond longing to help her. He wished for it in loud, croaking, frog-wishing sounds. Well, the stars heard his wish and they granted it. What? The stars heard the frog and they grant wishes? Yes, they did. And yes, they do. Without any warning, his croaks became perfectly comprehensible to the girl. And what had before been ribbit, ribbit, ribbit became, please, beautiful girl, let me help you. The girl stood up like a bolt. Who said that? She asked. I think I did, said the frog, as surprised as she was. You can talk, she asked. Apparently, he replied, bemused. I, I was offering to help you. Oh, would you, she cried, and the frog nearly fell to pieces. Oh, I would do anything. Really, I would. Just get my ball and I'll give you anything. You can have my jewels or my fanciest clothes or my crown. Your crown, the frog thought, but he didn't say it. He hadn't known that she was a princess, but of course, upon examining her again, what else could she have been? With all the gallantry he could muster, the frog replied, of course I'll get it. You don't have to give me anything. He stopped. Her mouth, looking like an unbloomed rose, had moved just slightly as he spoke and his emotions began to betray him. He stammered and turned a brighter shade of green. Um, he muttered, unless, he stammered, you could always, he stuttered, anything, the princess said, I'll give you anything. I was just thinking that we might be friends. Oh, of course we'll be friends, the princess said. I think we'll be ever so close, if you would just fetch my ball. Well, the princess didn't mean it, of course. It was just something nice you were supposed to say to lowly people, and apparently to frogs, so as not to hurt their feelings. She had learned all about not hurting people's feelings ages ago. But the frog, not having met many, any, humans, 
didn't understand that. And he, poor frog, believed her. So with a brimming heart, he dove into the depths of the well and brought up the princess's ball. She instantly grabbed it, shouted with joy, said, oh, thank you, frog, and immediately ran toward the castle. The frog, who had expected to spend a bit more time with her, now that they were ever so close, <clears throat> hopped down from the well and tried to follow her. Wait, he shouted. Wait for me. I can't keep up. But of course, the princess did not wait for him. She pretended she could not hear him. Later that night, the king sat at dinner with his daughter. As they ate their salad course, the quiet was broken by a faint splish splash, splish splash, coming from just under the windows. Then it seemed to start up the stairs. The princess went deathly white. There was a pause, and then there came a knocking on the door. What's that? the king asked. What? I don't hear anything, said the princess. The knocking continued. That, said the king. But the princess had already leaped from her chair and rushed to the front door. She opened it a crack. There, waiting wet and expectant on the doorstep, was the frog. She slammed the door and returned to the dinner table. The king examined her pale features. Who was it, my dear? he asked. Oh, nobody, she said and shoveled far too much salad into her mouth so as not to be able to say any more. The knocking came again. It is someone, the king insisted. Who is it? The princess burst into tears. He's an awful, ugly old frog, she cried. He fetched my ball for me when it was lost in the well, and I told him he could be my friend. Oh, it's terrible. The princess's wails echoed off the ceiling. Ah! The king, who had learned long ago that the princess could turn her tears on and off whenever she wanted to, insisted that she open the door and bring the creature in. Meanwhile, the frog nervously knocked at the door again. Perhaps, he thought, the princess hadn't seen him when she opened the door. He was rather small, of course. Easy to overlook. He repeated this to himself, attempting to, cover, attempting to cover up a deeper fear that she had, in fact, seen him and slammed the door because of it. But his fears were allayed when the door opened again and the princess appeared. He broke into his broadest frog grin and said, Good evening, princess. I was just passing by, and I thought I might stop in to call upon you. Is this a convenient time? He had rehearsed this speech during the three hours it took him to hop from his well to the castle's door. Well, it isn't really, said the princess, and she began to close the door again, when from the dining room the king bellowed, Invite him to dinner! The princess scowled. The frog's heart swelled as he saw the stunning hall. The servants lined up against the walls, the glorious dining table, and the king, the king, seated at its head. The king was very polite to him and offered him a chair, but the frog was too short to get up into it. Pick him up, the king commanded his daughter. The frog's heart began to flutter. She was going to touch him. He pictured her delicate fingers lifting him into the air. He sighed in anticipation. Anticipation, I'm sorry. Abruptly, he was dangling from one foot and just as abruptly, abruptly dropped onto the hard wood of a chair. He looked up. The princess was grimacing. I need to wash my hands now, daddy, she said. Humiliation swept over the frog. Really, said the frog, I am quite clean. 
It's those dreadful salamanders who give us well dwellers a bad name. But the princess was already washing her hands in a bowl brought over by a servant. The frog sat awkwardly on his chair for a while. He certainly couldn't reach the table. He couldn't even see if there was food on it to eat. Presently, the king noticed this. Honey, lift your friend up onto the table so he can have his soup. The salad course had been finished, you see, and the soup had been brought out. The frog found himself suddenly lifted and plopped down on the table, and he flushed to see the princess anxiously calling for the washing bowl again. He brought his face over the steaming saucer of soup and smelled it. Luxuriant, he said to the king. What is it? The princess let out a guffaw. The king began to turn red. Terror took hold of the frog. What had he said? The princess was laughing loudly and cruelly now. He couldn't think of what he had done wrong. He looked imploringly at the beautiful girl. It's frog's leg soup, she cried, laughing and pointing. Servants stifled their laughter behind their hands. The king, though, was deeply embarrassed. Take this away, he cried. Presently, other food was brought, though the frog had entirely lost his appetite. A few times he tried to engage the table in conversation, but each time the princess snickered or insulted him. By the end of the dinner, he was on the verge of tears. His dreams of a new life with the sky-eyed princess were dead. I am tired, he said. Perhaps I should go. Perhaps you should, the princess agreed. But the king said, take him with you upstairs. He can sleep on a pillow in your room. Certainly you won't make him walk, hop, all the way home in the dark. A weasel might get him. I wouldn't care, the princess announced, and I'm not touching him again. A few of the servants chortled, and the frog wished that he had never made his stupid wish. But wishes cannot be unwished, no matter how one wishes it. A wish is a powerful thing. It had the frog in its grip, and it was not about to let him go. Finally, the king convinced his daughter, through threats and imprecations, to take the poor frog upstairs. She did this as quickly as she could, holding him by a single leg and bouncing him as she climbed the long, winding staircases. He was afraid he might come to pieces, though then they could use me in the soup, he thought bitterly. As he watched the little girl, he marveled at her lack of feeling and also at her beautiful, deep blue eyes. If only she would like me, he thought, if only. They reached her room and she dropped into the floor and went into her washroom to prepare for bed. When she emerged, she found him huddled in a damp corner, trying in vain to pretend he was at home, at the bottom of his loathed well. At least it was better than this, he thought. She approached him and he shivered with fear, but her face had changed. It was softer, maybe even sympathetic. Hope blossomed in his little chest. Gently, she reached down and took him under his belly. He shivered. She lifted him, lifted him up so he was near her face. He stared at her rose lips and into her cerulean eyes, and she kissed him right? That's, what's ha that's what happens now, doesn't it? Of course not. What sense would that make? As anyone who's read The Brothers Grimm would know, this is actually when she throws him against a wall with all of her might in attempt to kill him. And only then, after the attempted murder, does he reveal himself as an enchanted prince. And then they get married and live happily ever after, which is clearly idiotic, 
why would they live happily ever after if she's just tried to kill him? And why would being smashed against a wall turn him back into a prince? And who said he was a prince in the first place? At this point, I ought to make something clear. There are three versions of this story. There is the kitty version, where they kiss. Obviously false. There is the grim version, where she throws him against the wall, and then they get married, which is, if you ask me, even more ridiculous than the kitty version. And then there is the true version, which, what actually happened, which is this. The princess took the frog by one leg, swung him around her head, hurled him as hard as she could at the wall of her room. But as she swung him, she held on too tight and his little leg came off. So the frog flew across the room and slammed into the wall. The princess found herself holding a single frog leg in her hand, screamed and threw it out the window where it was eaten by a weasel. As you might have suspected, our poor frog did not regain the form of a prince because he had never been a prince. He was a frog, a frog in love with a beautiful, cruel princess, which means that being thrown against a wall hurts in all sorts of ways. The frog lay crumpled in a heap at the base of the wall. He was bleeding from the place where his leg had been. For when you prick frogs, they do indeed bleed. While the princess stared at him with a disgusting air of satisfaction, with all the dignity he had left to him, the little frog hobbled out of her room, down the great stairs, and out into the night, trailing froggy blood after him as he went. The End my guess is that everyone's a little upset right now. Some of you are upset because of all the horrible things that just happened to that poor frog. You like the frog. He's kind and honest and his emotions are deep and pure. And you don't like seeing him hurt, right? Others of you might be upset because the frog story wasn't horrible enough. Yes, he had his heart broken, his leg torn off, and eaten by a weasel, and was hurled against a stone wall. But no one died. There were no pools of blood and vomit. Everyone had all of their clothing on. Well, nobody should be worried. The frog will be fine. He will be more than fine. He will be great. He will be awesome. He will be heroic. Remember that. Repeat it and hold it close to your heart. You'll need to. Because before that happens, the story will get more horrible. Like way, way more horrible. Like blood and vomit and no clothing horrible. But through it all, the frog will be okay. That's a promise. And Jack and Jill? Will they be okay too? Sure. Sort of. All right, that's the end of this opening chapter of In a Glass Grimly. Uh, today's lesson, you are going to have to answer some questions about the story I just read you. Um, and then in later readings, we'll continue on with this book. But first, I got to find out if you like it. So be sure to open up your lesson for today and let me know what you think. See you later.